details that give, the, give us a historical context. And it almost ceases to impact us. I was talking to um, you know, somebody the other day and talking about this, the fact that when the evangelists were describing the crucifixion, now thinking back about, let's say you had found a copy of the Gospels or you were listening to, that's how you probably would encounter the Gospels, listening to a Gospel being read and you really didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, and you came to a certain part in the story, and it just says very simply, and they crucified him. You know, the gospel writers don't really describe what happened, but nonetheless, it wasn't necessary. That's why they never really describe what happened, because when the gospel writers wrote their stories, they didn't think, oh, I'm going to be writing for people 2,000 years from now in Marietta, Georgia, and I'll have to explain these things to them. They presumed because it was a fact of life all over the Roman world. Everyone had seen victims of crucifixion. Everybody knew what it involved. Everybody knew the process. No one had to describe it. But because we're so far removed from that culture, it almost ceases to impact us. We kind of know it was painful. We know it was humiliating. We kind of know these things, but not the way we really should. And that means we don't appreciate them the way that we really should. And so this is why I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping to bring to your consciousness of maybe a greater, deep, deeper appreciation of what the Lord experienced and also the historical context because there's always a backstory. You know, the Gospels are very, very, very short. They give us very little detail about most things. Again, because it was presumed. You know, I was, th I was thinking about this the other day too. We had a parishioner and we took her out. We were out someplace, driving someplace, and we stopped for lunch at McDonald's. And she was from Greece. Now, she had never eaten a hamburger before. I'd never seen this, okay? This is not, not that long ago, this is like in the 1990s. So, you know, we, she, she sat down at the table, she unwraps the thing and she's looking at it and she opens the bun and she looks at the meat and she, she turned it all around, she was examining it, okay? Now, if I was about to say, tell, write a story and talk about how family went to McDonald's and how they ate their hamburgers, it would never occur to me to explain what hamburger is, right? Or how you ate it what it looked like, what it contained. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about all of the books of the New Testament. There is a historical context that is absolutely vital if we're going to understand what it is we're talking about. Now, not because the evangelists are writing for an audience of their time. So they're presuming that we know these things, but we don't know them, we have to be taught them. The church, however, also was very, very keen on making sure that we understood the historical context of everything. And the church always prepares us, not only historically, but spiritually for everything that is to come. So as you know, we have a period before Great Lent called Triodion, right? We hear those gospel readings like Zacchaeus and you know, publican and the Pharisee, we say, oh, you know, Lent is coming. It's sort of preparing us for Lent. Then Lent is preparing us for Holy Week, but also the events and the gospel readings of early Holy Week prepare us for what's happening in later Holy Week. So the church is quite keen on making sure that we understand what happened to Christ and why. And it gives us such a, a more profound experience of the later part of Holy Week. I'm assuming that everybody goes to church, right? For all of Holy Week, yes. If you haven't yet, you should. Okay, there's nothing like it. Be I know you're here on Palm Sunday. You probably have a luncheon afterwards, and you don't feel like coming back to church, but come back Palm Sunday evening, come Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, every single step of the way because all of those services are explaining to us what happened on Thursday and Friday and why it happened. So it's very important. So um, we need to have the historical context. So let's talk about what happens in those Gospels of early Holy Week because they give us 
this historical context that is so critical because even today, let's say you have Jewish friends or you're somewhat familiar with Judaism because of what you see on TV or maybe you lived in New York where you had a lot of Jewish uh, you know, neighbors or something like this. Modern Judaism is nothing like Second Temple Judaism, which is what we're talking about in the time of Christ. There's no priests in Judaism today. There's no temple. It doesn't matter if, you know, there's a, you drive by something that says Temple Beth Shalom or Temple Beth Israel. That's not a temple. That's a synagogue. Modern Judaism is nothing like biblical Judaism. The groups that exist today in Judaism um, don't, didn't exist back in those days, except for the, the rabbis, of course. So in the Gospels of Early Holy Week, the church introduces us to the people that we are familiar with that are sort of traditional opponents of the Lord. Those are usually the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the people that we know from Galilee. So in the early part of Jesus's ministry where he's spending more time up in Galilee in the north, these are the groups that oppose him most frequently. And that's because they, are direct, they feel challenged or threatened by the Lord because of his teachings. So one group we hear about a lot is the Pharisees. Now, who are they besides sort of religious nitpickers? That's, this is how they come across, really, for us, the religious nitpickers. Well, the Pharisees were the people who insisted that the most important thing that every Jew could do is keep the law of Moses very, very, very strictly. Now, what's the law of Moses? If you ask a Christian, they're going to say the Ten Commandments. That's what we think of, right? But if that's what comes to your mind, you have to get that out of your mind. Whenever Jesus is asked about the law, they're not talking about the Ten Commandments. They're not even just talking about rules that are in the Bible, because there were at least 613 rules written down in the Bible. But there were, in addition to that, thousands and thousands of other rules that had been added over time. So when Moses was alive, that would be like 1200 BC, many rules were written down. The Lord said, write these things down. And so there's some of the laws of ritual purity and against us working on the Sabbath and things like this. This is in the Torah or the Pentateuch, in books like Exodus and Leviticus, etc. primarily in those books, and, and Deuteronomy. Those are, that's where you find most of those laws. So, but over hundreds of years between Jesus, I mean, Mount Moses and Jesus, other questions arose. And so these are the kinds of questions people would ask the rabbis. And we see Jesus being asked this question. Rabbi, is it lawful to, can I do this? In other words, am I allowed to do this? Is it lawful to do this or that or the other thing? So that question continues to be asked today by, by observant Jews. Now today, most Jews, they just fall on a different variety of spectrums. Some Jews aren't religious at all. They're just ethnically Jewish. Then others are very, very, very religiously observant. And then others, maybe a little bit, others maybe only at Passover, and others, you know, sort of not at all. So how, how, where they fall on that spectrum has to do with the degree to which they keep all of these rules. So today, for example, we have cell phones, and cell phones are pretty recent, you know, development. So the question would write, uh, array, would arise, is it lawful to use a cell phone on the Sabbath? Okay, that's an example of the kinds of questions that would keep coming up. And as more and more and more um, technology arises, these kinds of questions get asked. So that aspect of Judaism, the continuing question of what can I do on the Sabbath or what is defiling, if I touch this or associate with this person or engage in this activity, does it make me unclean? Not physically, but ritually unclean. This is a question, and that question continues to be asked. So these are, this is a different mindset. It's a different world. So if you go to Israel today, and it's the Sabbath, 
It's very likely if you're staying in a hotel, if especially if it's in, in, in Jerusalem, a Jewish hotel and not a, you know, um, something that's run by Palestinians, you're going to find that on the Sabbath day, the elevator has been programmed to stop at every single floor. Now, why is that? Because it's against the law of Moses, if you're an observant Jew, to press the elevator button. Did you know that? It's considered work. Why? Pressing a button? We wouldn't think that that's work. But it is, because the elevator lifts you. You're not allowed to carry anything on the Sabbath. If this um, device is carrying you, you're breaking the Sabbath law. Well, but I'm just pressing a button, but the, still that's initiating that, you see, that event. So this is, these are the kinds of very, very specific questions of law that were going on at the time of Christ. So the Pharisees were constantly challenging him because Jesus was breaking the law, not the Ten Commandments, not even the rules that were in the Bible, but these additional rules that had developed over hundreds and hundreds of years since the time of Moses. For example, you can't heal someone on the Sabbath. Remember that this is usually how Jesus gets into trouble with the Pharisees. That's not in the Bible. It doesn't say that in the Bible that you can't heal someone. But somewhere along that hundreds of years of continuum, someone must have asked a rabbi, Rabbi, is it lawful to heal somebody on the Sabbath? And they would have said no, unless the person was dying. If they weren't dying, you had to make them wait. So this is what we used to see, you see, that, but this is true. So these are the Pharisees, and they're constantly challenging Jesus. Now, another group we hear about a lot are the scribes. Here again, if you hear the word scribe and you think about somebody who copies manuscripts, that wouldn't be incorrect unless you're talking about the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the scribes are the lawyers. And this is why sometimes, especially in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, they will call scribes lawyers. You know, a lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him thus and such. And don't imagine somebody with a brief case, briefcase headed off to court. That's not what we mean by lawyers. These are people who are specialists in those additional rules that the Pharisees were following. Now, why did they even exist? What is it about the Pharisees that was so different? Than, and well, because, and why, why were the scribes necessary and why do they always go together? Because most of those additional rules that the Pharisees had created over hundreds of years were not written down and they were called the oral law, or the traditions of the elders. We're talking about thousands of rules, thousands of rules. Now, the Pharisees said, everybody has to keep the rules anyhow. Well, what if you say, well, I don't even know what they are. You know what, a, you know what they would say to that today? What about, what, you know, if you say to the, if you get pulled over by a policeman, and you've, because you've broken some kind of a law, and you say, well, I didn't know, do you know what the answer to that is? All the alert. What? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So we obviously have lawyers here. That is what we say in the law. We're, tr we're taught that in law school. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's what a Pharisee would say. Okay? It doesn't matter if you don't know. And we're talking about thousands of rules. You're still, you still have to keep them. But they're religious rules. They're laws of ritual purity. And so those were the scribes. The scribes were the ones who were the absolute experts in the law. That's why the Bible sometimes calls them the lawyers, okay? They memorized those thousands of rules. And not only did they memorize the rules, but the interpretations of those rules by leading rabbis, you see? Now, one of the criticisms that they make about Jesus is that he is uneducated. Now, this doesn't mean that he couldn't read or write. We, we know he could, he, it's mentioned in the Gospels. But he never studied under a leading rabbi. He never studied under any rabbi. So as far as they were concerned, you know, he didn't have any authority. 
And one of the things that we see in the Gospels is the amazement of the crowd. Because when Jesus teaches, he just says what he thinks. He doesn't quote a rabbi or a scribe or some famous religious figure from the past. That's what the scribes used to do, just like lawyers would do today. They cite legal precedent. They don't go into court without saying, well, your, your honor, you know, in this particular case, Marbury versus Madison, the court ruled, da, 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 da. But that case can be distinguished because blah, 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 blah. Well, that's what the scribes used to do. They had memorized thousands of rules and the various interpretations by leading Jewish thinkers over the centuries. They were like little walking encyclopedias. They were highly respected. They wore a special kind of mantle. That's that big piece of cloth that sort of swings over, the wraps around and hangs across your shoulder, and had long fringes. And when they walked down the street, people would stand up in respect for a scribe. Well, they didn't like it when Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, right? They weren't used to having anybody talk to them that way. They consider themselves righteous because they were keeping all of the laws, uh, laws of ritual purity. That has to do with what is religiously acceptable, nothing to do with inner purity. And that's what the Lord was all about, right? He says, you strain out the gnat and you swallow the camel. Do you know why he uses that example? because both camel meat and insects were considered unclean in Jewish law. So they would be so careful to make sure they didn't eat the tiniest insect because that would make you unclean, it would defile you. But so they would strain out even a tiny little gnat so that they didn't get defiled by eating the insect, but then they would eat a whole camel. Of course, they didn't actually eat the camel, but Jesus was using this as an example of how they would ignore the big important things, all right? So these are the two main groups that Jesus encounters in Jerusalem, and they are constantly after him, trying to trap him and trick him, and we see these kinds of things in the Gospels of early Holy Week. So how many disciples did Jesus have? Be careful. Be careful. Not 12. Yes, thousands. We have to be careful about that because sometimes we like to say, oh, Jesus had 12 disciples, especially when not too many people come to church. Oh, Jesus only had 12 disciples. No, he didn't. He had thousands of disciples. Of course, the 12 are the inner core. But Jesus had a huge following, and that just aggravated the scribes and the Pharisees all the more because they didn't have that kind of a following. They all had their own disciples, but nothing like what Jesus attracted. So this is why they got so upset and they saw him as a threat to their authority and as a very bad example because as a rabbi, that's what Jesus was. And by the way, rabbi just means teacher. He's a teacher he should be teaching people to keep the law. That's what they thought. But instead, he was a bad example. He himself was violating the law by doing such things as what? We mentioned healing on the Sabbath. That's a common one. What else? How else did he make himself unclean? He ate with who? Tax collectors and sinners, right? Well, you know, when we think about that, we think about going to a restaurant where they, you know, give you the, your own <laughs> forks and knives wrapped up in a lo lovely, uh, you know, napkin, and you're sitting in a very sort of sanitary environment. No, no, no. People used to sit down together, either on couches or on the floor, and eat from a common plate in the middle of the table, if there was a table, with your hands. Okay, so again, notice how there's a, there's a sense of intimacy with that. Like we each have our own glass, we have our own plate, we have our own utensils. Do you, do you understand that the way they lived, sharing a common meal with somebody meant like you're sharing their life. Okay, so for Jesus to go to the house of a tax collector or to allow himself to be touched by a sinner meant that he was kind of, in their minds, 
approving of it because he was because he was sharing something very intimate and that's a meal all right so of course jesus wasn't approving of their lifestyle but that's how they understood it and he is being a very bad example as a rabbi by not preserving his own ritual purity so he eats with tax collectors and sinners that means he associates with the wrong people um, he uh, heals on the sabbath he touches dead people dead bodies and lepers and pe that's like most, among the most defiling things is a dead body the jews used to mark the graves with something white because not all graves like we you know that jesus was buried in a tomb most people were not buried in tombs they were buried in a grave on the ground and it was a, a source of great concern to the pharisees that they might step on a grave or walk over a grave and not know it and that would defile them okay they would there were also rules about uh, whether or not you would be defiled if uh, uh, so a body was being carried out to burial and you were by sitting by an open window when it passed by okay that would make you defiled then of course you have to go through a certain period of ritual cleansing and things like this so it's a very different mentality than what we have today now so jesus is a problem he's a threat because he has a lot of followers he's a bad example as a rabbi he's not only breaking the laws of ritual purity he is uneducated he's you know doesn't have a proper rabbinic education by the way they didn't have ordinations or certificates or anything like that a man who wanted to be a rabbi would go study with a rabbi for a while and after he was after so many years when the rabbi thought he was prepared enough he would say this is my disciple and i certify that he's qualified to to work as a rabbi that's what you did jesus never had any of that so as far as they were concerned he's uneducated he's poor of course that doesn't help he's from galilee you know come on at least if he was from jerusalem came from some noteworthy family that would be something in his favor but they, he has, doesn't come from any kind of privilege or special social background. And by acting on his own authority, Jesus committed blasphemy. All right, we hear that a lot. That's a big deal. That's a serious religious violation. Blasphemy, because Jesus did things like forgive sins. Remember, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins so this is how he showed that he did have authority to do and to be, behave as he did all right but why not is it possible i mean there was one big problem there's one big 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 problem as they denounced jesus again and again and again for doing all these things contrary to how it had always been done they, jesus was directly disagreeing with the pharisees he said you know my yoke is easy and my burden is light do you know why he said that because the pharisees called the law of moses a yoke y-o-k-e yoke that's that heavy wooden beam that they would put on the animals to keep them going straight to control them a yoke they called the law a yoke now remember the law is not the ten commandments the law is the thousands of rules of ritual purity now the pharisees kept adding more and more and more and more of those oral laws so that people were overwhelmed by all of the rules and jesus said my yoke is easy and my burden is light he didn't demand that people keep those laws of ritual purity and instead he says it doesn't matter what goes into your mouth that defiles you it's what comes out of your heart that's a tremendous departure from first century judaism so of course the jewish rulers and leaders did not approve of jesus now nonetheless he had a huge following so why did he have a huge following what do you think was it because he had pretty blonde hair and blue eyes and walked around with a nice white robe and you know 
looked like a hippie, kind of said, that's okay, God loves you, don't worry about anything. That's what we, a lot of people think about Jesus, right? What was it about him that attracted these huge crowds? When we talk about crowds, we're talking about major followers. Lots and lots of people believe Jesus to be the Messiah. Why? Because the Jewish leaders didn't think he's the Messiah. What is it about, about Jesus that caused people to think that he was the Messiah? What do you think? You go ahead. You're going to give me three things? Okay, let's hear it. Teaching and preaching. Teaching and preaching. What about it? That it was influencing them and guiding them correctly. Influencing them. Okay. They were convinced by his teaching is what you're saying. Okay, go ahead. By his signs and wonders. By his signs and wonders. And then a third, I would say, is the person and his personality. The third is the person and personality. I, I like everything you said. That's very good. So, yes, there is something to be said by the fact that even though what Jesus was saying seemed to be at variance with what the other Jewish leaders were saying, it really wasn't. In other words, what we have in the Christian faith is not a complete departure from Judaism. It was really, he was calling people back to the core of what the law was really about, and that is love of neighbor. That is true, okay? And they recognized that. It had been lost with all of the rules and the emphasis on rule observance. That is correct. And he was very charismatic. You're absolutely right. I think that he had a grace that exuded from him that was very magnetic and attractive to people, and he cared about them. He loved them, and they knew it, and they responded to that. But one of the, the main one I wanted to focus on was what you mentioned, his signs and wonders. That creates the biggest problem for the Pharisees. And why is it a problem? Because they could not explain how Jesus was able to do all of those things. This is a big problem for the Pharisees because they said he's a blasphemer and he's a lawbreaker and he's a bad rabbi. Don't listen to him. How do you explain the, what they call the signs? Those are what we would call miracles. Because he clearly had extraordinary powers. No one has done anything even close to what Jesus did since then, or even before then, right? There were some prophets who did a few miracles, like Elijah and others, but nothing like Jesus. Day after day after day, huge crowds following him, and he heals them from every conceivable illness and, and disability and demonic possession. And he does it easily, without effort, effortlessly. So how do you explain that? This they had a lot of trouble with. Now, why did the people believe that he was the, uh, had, was the Messiah because of this? Because when they went to the synagogue and they would hear the scriptures read, they would hear the prophecies about the Messiah. And everybody knew what they were. Among them, the prophecy was that the Messiah would give sight to the blind and the lame would walk and the deaf would hear. They knew those prophecies. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And now here comes Jesus. He's able to do all of those things. You see, it wasn't easy. Somebody couldn't just get up and say, I'm the Messiah, follow me. Because you have to be able to prove it. And that was one of the main things. That's from the book of Isaiah. That he would be a wonder worker. And he would be righteous and holy. And all of these things. So you see, that wasn't, you couldn't fool people just by saying, I'm the Messiah. It wasn't just mere charisma. So, or even extraordinary preaching. This is why the ordinary people were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's the number one problem for the Jewish leaders, especially the Pharisees. How do you explain his extraordinary powers? So, how did they explain it? What did they say? He does this, go ahead. That's right. With the power of the devil. So, you know, because power, spiritual power, could only come from one of two places, either God or the devil. They decided it can't be from God because he doesn't agree with us. 
right? Because he's not one of us. He's not doing the kinds of things we do. He's not insisting on the things that we insist. And instead, it must come from the devil. His power comes from the devil. So this is what we see, of course. Now, why not consider that maybe he is the Messiah? Why do they assume that the power must come from the devil rather than re sort of rethinking their ideas about what the Messiah would be? Because, you know, I, could, I gave you some sort of sociological factors. Jesus is from Nazareth and he's, you know, uneducated and poor and things like this. Well, the reason is because in the mind of the Jewish people, both then and in, in, in con also continuing today, the idea is that if you are um, wealthy, if you have a good position, highly respected, many children, in other words, if you have blessings from God, it's because God approves of you. You are found righteous by God, okay? You're righteous. God approves of you. That's why you're rich. You're rich because God has blessed you, and God wouldn't bless you unless you were a good person, okay? And by the way, that was in the Roman mind too. For the Roman mind and the Jewish mind, if you were wealthy, you were good. If you were poor, conversely, you must be bad. So the Romans assumed that if you're poor, you're, you're dishonest and you're a thief. But if for the Jews, if you're poor, it's because God's punishing you for something. So that's the reason why the Jewish leaders had a lot of difficulty, you know, changing their minds about Jesus in spite of the miracles, because they are the ones who have power and position and respect and authority and money. Obviously, God approves of them. God doesn't approve of this guy. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So this is what we call this, we call this deuteronomistic thinking. And so they assume that God would agree with them. It's like you make a bunch of rules and you assume that, well, God agrees with us because he's put us in charge. Therefore, the rules must be correct. And that's what they, that's what they assume. So they, were, they disagreed with Jesus and they were afraid of him. They feared him because of his, his authority his um, influence over the crowds and things like this. Now, by the way, in terms of those signs and wonders uh, that you mentioned, the, the miracles of the Lord, it is common for people to say, well, there's no proof that these things ever happened or whatever. You know, what's really interesting about that is there are no contemporary um, writings of any kind, even for the first, I don't know, hundreds of years, that ever question whether or not Jesus did miracles, okay? Because today, people say, because we have this sort of scientific way of thinking, people will say, well, these things obviously never happened. These are mythologies and things like this. But if these things never happened, first of all, Jesus wouldn't have the following that he had if these things never happened. People wouldn't be saying he's the Messiah. That's one thing. But in addition to that, that would have been the easiest way for the Jews to refute him. They could have said in the Jewish writings of the end of the first century, second century, third century, when they were really attacking the Christian faith, they easily could have said, Jesus didn't do all those miracles the Christians claim. They could have said that, but not one Jewish writing ever says that. And that shows you that they never tried to refute it because Jesus was famous as a wonder worker. So the only way they could refute it is to say that he got his power from the devil, you see. But that doesn't mean the things didn't happen. It only leaves a question of where did he get his power from. So with that as a little bit of a background, that's, those are the opponents of Jesus in, up there in Galilee. So where do we see these kinds of, um, where, where do we see him get, coming into conflict with people later down in Jerusalem, this is when it gets really serious. There are three main catalysts that seem to be responsible or the, the main events which cause the arrest and crucifixion of Christ. So we'll turn to those right now. The first one is something that only the Orthodox Church remembers, at least 
you know, in the connection with Holy Week, and that is the raising of Lazarus. Now, the raising of Lazarus was a feast, is what we call Saturday of Lazarus, is a feast in the early, early church. You know, this was something that was never forgotten, its connection to Christ, and the entry into Jerusalem was never forgotten. And it was so different and so significant. So we keep that in the Orthodox faith. Nobody else has Saturday of Lazarus. Catholics don't have it. Protestants don't have it. We have it because historically it's tied to Passion Week. So how, why is it so different than everything that had come before? Because Jesus had raised other people from the dead, right? But not someone who had been dead for four days. And this is a kind of death that nobody could because they recover from or come out of. When somebody died, they were buried almost immediately. They were buried that same day. Unless they died late in the evening, then maybe they would be buried the next morning. But if the other people that Jesus had raised from the dead had only died, you know, an hour or two or maybe three or four hours before. Remember that story in, in the book of Acts? We have this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they lie to the apostles, and the husband drops dead, and they take his body, and they take him out and bury him. Or, and the wife comes in later. She doesn't even know that the husband's dead, and she, drops, she lies to them. She drops dead. Remember that story? Well, that just shows you. They didn't say, well, we better wait till the wife comes so we can have a funeral and plan the funeral, and who's going to speak, and do we have fish for the macaria? They don't, they don't do that. If somebody dies, you wrap them up, and within hours, you know, a couple hours, they're in the tomb. Okay? In the case of Lazarus, he had been dead for four days. So, be careful. Jesus didn't wait for Lazarus to die. Maybe be careful about that. Don't say that he waited for Lazarus to die. When Jesus gets the word that Lazarus is sick, he knows that Lazarus has already died. Okay, but he waits there for two more days. Then he leaves. There's no reason to rush because Lazarus has already died. But when he arrives there, the, you know, the sisters are in mourning, and there are a lot of people there who have come from Jerusalem because it was very close by. And people are, they, there was a one week of very serious mourning for the family. And people were there who were from the village of Bethany, and they had you know, helped prepare the body. They had carried him to the tomb. They put him in the tomb. They knew when all this had happened. There's no question that Lazarus has been dead for a long time. There was also a Jewish sort of, we could say, tradition that the soul only stayed with the body, or the soul stayed with the body for three days after death. That when we die, we, our soul is sort of traumatized by that, doesn't want to leave the body because the soul has been in the body our whole life. So the soul doesn't want to leave the body, and on the fourth day it sees that the body has begun to decay, so it leaves. So the idea behind that is there's no way somebody can come alive because their soul is gone after four days, okay? Nonetheless, as you know, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And there are lots of witnesses, not only witnesses to the event, but people there who had actually buried Lazarus. And, you know, people, it's not like they took him to a mortuary with his best suit. People who washed the body, wrapped the body. He was cold, he was stiff. They took care of him. And they, they did, people did this physically in their own houses. You can't tell these people that Lazarus never died. Okay, and he just fell asleep or he was unconscious. He had every signs of rigor mortis. He was dead, dead, dead. They put him in the, his tomb. You, know, you understand what I'm trying to say? So nobody could dispute this sign, the greatest of all the signs. So when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it tells us in the gospel that some of the people went back to Bethany, but others went straight to Jerusalem. You know, there's always some people like that, right? Little tattletales that we're going to run off and tell the high priest what happened, right? And so what happens next? There's an emergency meeting of the great Sanhedrin. And what do they say? What are we going to do about Jesus? He does too many signs too many signs. 
And so they're trying to figure out how they can control him. They're worried. Why are they worried? They don't say, what are we going to do about Jesus? Maybe he's the Messiah after all. No, 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 no. What are we going to do about Jesus? He does too many signs. And finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, says, you don't understand. It's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed. So what's that about? Why would the nation be destroyed by Jesus? They assume because he has such a following and he is so powerful, nobody can argue with his spiritual powers, that he had the potential to start a revolt. Now, they don't know that Jesus is not interested in political power. They don't know that. They probably figured he's just like them. They, he wants power. He wants money. He wants adulation. He wants all those things because that's what they wanted. That's what motivated the Jewish leaders. So they're worried about him, and they make a resolution. They resolve. This is the word that's used in, in Greek. They resolve to put him to death. So that's after the raising of Lazarus. But they're looking for an opportunity. Now, had they tried to arrest him before? Yes. What about up in Galilee? Had they tried to put him to death before? Yes. The very first time he preached at the synagogue of Nazareth. Imagine going to your hometown and making your first, giving your first sermon and people try to kill you afterwards. Imagine that. That's literally what happened. It says they tried to throw him off a cliff. So this had happened many times in the past, but now they've resolved, they passed a resolution of the council to put him to death. And it says after that, Jesus didn't really go around openly after that because, of course, there's a tremendous threat to him. But this is what, is, this is what they're most afraid of. They're afraid, that, now this is in Jerusalem, this is the crowd in Jerusalem, this is not the scribes and Pharisees I talked about. These are the chief priests, the high priests, the elders, the rulers of Judaism are afraid of Jesus, okay? Not just the religious authorities, but these are religious authorities with real power in Jerusalem, and they're afraid of him. So they resolve to put him to death. Now, the day after the Saturday of Lazarus, we celebrate the um, entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. And when the people welcome the Lord into the city, they're shouting for him, right? Hosanna, that means save us. Hosanna to the king of Israel. That's, you know, a very provocative statement. Hosanna, son of David. That's a messianic title. They're saying that they recognize him as the Messiah. Blessed is the one who comes. How many times do we say that on Palm Sunday? A zillion times. Every hymn practically ends with evlogi menos o adhomenos, right? Blessed is the one who comes. That is a messianic title. We don't think of it. We're thinking, oh, he's coming in. He's riding a donkey. Blessed is the one who is coming in on the donkey. No, the coming one is a messianic title because for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had waited for the Messiah. So they started to refer to him as the one who is to come or the coming one. This is why, pay attention to this on the Saturday of Lazarus, when you're listening to the gospel reading, um, when Jesus says to, to Martha, your brother, well, she said, you know, both of the sisters say, well, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus says to Martha, you know, your brother will rise again. She says, yes, I know. Um, and he says, he says I, you know, I'll see him again at the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And she says to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the one who is to come or the one coming into the world. Well, Jesus is standing right in front of her. Why is she saying you're the one coming? She's, by the, saying that, she's saying, I still believe that you're the Messiah. She's calling him by this title, the coming one. So Jesus comes into the city. He's hailed by these huge crowds that are claiming him as the Messiah, which for most people has certain political overtones. And the, the Sanhedrin sees this and says, you see, we were right. The whole world is falling after him. We have to take care of this guy and he has to be dead before Passover because that Passover is a time of great political and religious fervor. So they were determined that he has to die. 
Now, when the Lord comes into the city after he comes in, he goes to the temple mount and he cleanses the temple. Now, this is told in all four Gospels, by the way, which should tell you something that's a very important event in terms of the crucifixion of Christ, the cleansing of the temple. It's a little bit strange way we refer to it, the cleansing of the temple. Obviously, it's a kind of religious cleansing because Jesus made a mess. He didn't really take a bucket and clean it, right? Uh, he overturned the tables of the money changers and the people who sold the animals and got rid of them. So this is what we call the cleansing of the temple. This e event, by the way, makes us a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, or, or sometimes people use this as an excuse for their own anger. Well, even Jesus got angry, you know. No, no, no. Jesus didn't get angry. Jesus didn't lose his temper. Think about it. I mean, he'd been coming to the temple several times a year for his whole life. All of a sudden, he notices that they're selling animals and things, and he got, gets mad and flips out and trashes the temple. It's not like that at all. Jesus, this is a deliberate act. It's a deliberate statement that he's making about how they're treating the temple. And he knew that it would directly lead to his arrest and his crucifixion. Okay, so that's why he didn't do it before, because the time had not yet come, you see. So everything the Lord did was at a certain time. There was part of a plan of God that was in place here. So what is it about the cleansing of the temple that we just think, oh, Jesus got mad and threw some things around? No, it's not like that at all. It's a deliberate statement that was seen as the most serious provocation Okay, which is what it literally directly leads to his arrest and crucifixion. Well, the temple in Jerusalem is nothing like anything we have on earth today. The temple in Jerusalem was a massive complex. It took about 25% of the land of the city at that time. And it was the highest point, it occupied the highest point in elevation in the city of Jerusalem. And the temple of Jerusalem was very, very important to the Jews. There is no Jewish temple anymore because it was the only place where the Jews could offer animal sacrifice. The only place in the whole world. Now compare that to, say, temples to Zeus or Jupiter, same God. There's lots of them. There were there was temples to Zeus all over the Roman world. Temples for Aphrodite, temples to all kinds of different gods, lots and lots of them, but only one temple for the Jews, and that was in Jerusalem. That, for the Jews, it was like the center of the earth. It was the place where you were closest to God. It was a place where God really was present in a real sense with his people. And this is where you went to be cleansed, to offer, as I said, animal sacrifice for all the important events of your life and also for the important feasts of Judaism. This didn't happen in a synagogue. There were thousands of synagogues, but this is a place where you went for instruction, where you went to sing hymns, to hear a sermon, and things like this for prayers on a weekly basis, not the temple. The temple was a massive and complex institution. A huge, it had a huge infrastructure. It was it was gigantic and made of the most expensive and finest materials because it was the only one in the world. And of course, everything we do has to be the best for God. So Herod the Great had begun a program to enlarge and beautify the temple, not because he was very religious, but because he was king of the Jews, and because it's the only Jewish temple, he wanted it to be spectacular. And at the time of Christ, it had already been going on for 46 years. But it continued for another 30-some years until it was actually destroyed by the Romans. So the temple was a space that was a holy space and involved a lot of, very, as describe it in the book, restrictive, increasingly restrictive spaces, but it was spectacularly beautiful. It was 
composed of the finest alabaster and whitest and purest white marble, gigantic columns. There was a colonnade. It's on, the, it's on a plateau, basically, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And rimming the entire um, mountain, practically, there was a double colonnade, uh, not just two columns, but two sets of columns on either side you know, that covered a, all the, as I said, all the way around in a, in a space about as wide as this room with a covering that was carved cedar wood. And that's when it says Jesus was teaching at the temple. It was one of these, along one of these colonnades. It provided shelter from rain and sun. So it had these beautiful outdoor spaces and also covered spaces where people would gather. And then it had actual, where anybody could be in those spaces because they weren't sacred spaces. But if you wanted to worship, if you were ritually clean, you could enter into one of the sacred courts. First, the court of the women, and then beyond that, the court of Israel for men, if you're offering a sacrifice. Beyond that was the court of the priests, and beyond that was the holy place. And these areas were decorated with gold and silver, and especially the holy place, which was a like a building within a courtyard, because they burnt animals, you know, they burnt animals. So you had to have, they had to be courtyards so the smoke could rise. All temples weren't enclosed spaces like a church. They had to have a space where the smoke could go up. So inside of the court where the animals were sacrificed was the holy place. And the whole exterior of that building, which was an enclosed building, was covered with plates of gold, the thickness of a coin. And on top of it, to make sure that, and because these are open air spaces, birds didn't sit down and then poop on the temple of the Lord, they had gold spikes, not like what well, we would have wire to keep the little pigeons off, but made of gold, okay? In the court of the priests, there was a massive altar, because again, when we think about the temple, we think about maybe a big church. We're talking about an altar that was 50 feet square and 25 feet off the ground. Massive amounts of, of animals and sacrifices were performed there, and this meant a lot of incense, wood, salt, water, shoe bread, and lots and lots of priests to manage all of these sacrifices. There were between 10 and 18,000 ordinary priests who used to come to the temple and serve on a rotation basis, except for the big feast, then they would all come. So the temple was a massive complex with a lot of moving parts, and it required a tremendous amount of administration, had lots of different rooms. There was a room for where the Sanhedrin meant. There was a room where they kept the, the wood. There was a room where they had all the incense. There was a place where they, they took, there was a special apartment for the high priest where they would keep him uh, separate from anything that might defile him just before various um, holidays and observances. So this was a very complex institution and it also attracted a lot of money. The temple treasury had so much coinage that people had stopped counting it. They had no idea how much money was in there. They had stopped counting it about 300 years before Christ. That's how much it was. And that was before Herod the Great and all of his embellishments and all of the gold um, embellishments. They put a lot of gold decoration on top of the white marble so that when people saw the interior of the courts of the temple and the holy place, it was dazzling, so beautiful, so impressive. Even the Romans talked about the Jewish temple, that there was nothing like it. It was the largest temple in the world. That's saying something. The largest temple complex in the world, because there was only one for the Jews. So Jesus comes and disrupts everything by overturning the tables of the money changers and driving out the sacrificial animals and this kind of a thing. And is he, is he complaining about Jewish worship? No, he's not complaining about Jewish worship. He's not protesting even animal sacrifice. 
what is he protesting? He's protesting the corruption of the Jewish leaders because they were so corrupt because of all the money that flowed through the temple. The high priests and the chief priests were tremendously corrupt because they controlled everything. And they liked the fact that they controlled everything. It's where they got all their wealth and their power from. These are not ordinary priests like the father of John the Baptist. These are the chief priests and they lived lives of tremendous wealth and privilege. Now Jesus comes with a huge following and he makes a statement. And he says, you've turned my father's house into a den of robbers. And that got their attention. And what do they say to him? What do they say? By what authority do you do these things? And he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they didn't know what he was talking about. But what authority do you do these things? This is one of the questions we see raised in the Gospels of Early Holy Week. Pay attention to that. Because in the Gospels of Early Holy Week, the church is explaining to us what kinds of things the Lord did that made people upset. Because we think, oh Jesus, you know, why would anybody want to kill him? Well, pay attention to the stories and you might begin to understand. When they ask him, by what authority do you do these things? He says, tell me about John the Baptist. By what authority did he baptize? And they didn't want to answer because they didn't really believe that John was from God, but the people did. So they said, well, uh, 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 we don't know. Jesus said, well, then I'm not answering you. So he begins to propose, he asks these parables. He talks about the parable of the two sons. There are two sons. The father asked them each to go and work in the vineyard. The first son says, no, I'm not going to go, but later he goes. The second son says, I'm going to go, but later he doesn't go. Which one did the father's will? It's the one who, even though he denied God, changed his mind. Okay? Then he tells the story of the, uh, of the, um, the wicked tenants. Remember the story about a man who planted a vineyard? The vineyard represents Israel. And... Uh, lent it out to tenants and then tried to co co collect the fruits, the rents. And he sent his servants and first they beat them, then they abused them, then they killed them. And he said, I will send my son. They will respect him. And they killed the son. Remember that? So who are, they, Jesus asked the question, what is God going to do? What, what is the owner going to do to those wicked tenants? Oh, he'll take away the vineyard and give it to other people. And they knew Jesus was talking about them. And he said, have you not heard? that the stone which the builders have rejected turned out to be the cornerstone, the most important stone. Therefore, this vineyard which has been given to you will be taken away from you. And they were furious with him because he said this in front of all the crowds, you see? And they tried to trap him and trick him with various questions like about the coin being offered to Caesar. Is it lawful? Rabbi, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? They thought they had him trapped. Why are they asking this? Not because they care about his opinion, but because they are hoping that he will say something through which or because of which would, that would allow them to report him to the Roman authorities so he can be arrested. So these are some of the things that happen that gets the Lord into trouble. So I think that we have to recognize that Jesus was was pointing out the corruption, the lack of spiritual fruits, the, the failings of the Jewish leaders. Again, he's not talking about all the Jewish people, only the Jewish leaders, but they weren't, uh, they, didn't care, they didn't want to hear that, and they were concerned about losing their standing in society, their reputation, their power, their influence, their money, their political power, not just their religious power, but their political power. And so they decided that Jesus had to be eliminated. So in part two, we're going to talk about Judas and the arrest and the Jewish trial. And I think I went over a little bit. I know I was supposed to ask for some questions. Should we stop and ask for any, are there any questions we can handle quickly? Oh, we'll just try to keep it quick, too. And we'll keep it quick. Oh, it's good enough.
because I'm I went over a bit. Hi. Thank you very much. That's a way to handle it. I had a question regarding the Pharisees, their belief in the Bible that describes the law of the wealth and the poverty. Mm -hmm. How did the prophets fit into their whole nice yeah. system? Because they respected the writings of the prophets. That's right. And even in Maccabees, they had the idea of we're going to set aside for our prophets to come along. And the prophets didn't have the authority of isolating their rabbi and their branch of authority. So That's right. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so um, this is why Jesus criticizes them because they're saying, if we lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have killed the prophets. So they, they um, did not recognize the prophets. I mean, that, that's part of that. One of the points that you're making, which is really excellent, and this is what the fathers of the church said, and this is why we don't have that idea, this Deuteronomistic idea, if you're rich, it's because God has blessed you, therefore you must be good. We don't equate that. Uh, money and say, worldly success means that God approves of you. So they used to, th but they did think that. And that's why, um, that's why it didn't make sense because the, the prophets all suffered. All the prophets died at the hands of their own people. So they were just, they recognized that it was a mistake later. And you might say that some of them, because you know, even though we say, well, the Jews didn't believe in Jesus, that's not exactly true. Many of them did, right? Many of them did come to faith in Christ. So, um, and one of them is St. Paul. So even if they recognized that some of the people came to faith in Christ after the time, even if they didn't approve of him at the time, but they recognized about the prophets that they were wrong, but they said, oh, our fathers did that, we wouldn't have done that. You see what I'm trying to say? The prophets, Jesus is more like the prophets in the fact that the prophets were calling the people to return to the heart of the law, which is justice and mercy. For example, there's rules in the law of Moses that you cannot put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. You can't mock a deaf person. What is that? What is that about? It's about showing love and compassion and mercy. So that's why Jesus quotes Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So they knew that the, that the prophets were in line with this idea of spiritual renewal on the inside, but because they spend so much time focusing on ritual purity, it takes them away from that inner purity. And they had come to believe that what was most important is following the rules. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. You didn't have to mention the, the Sadducees, the Essenes, or the Zealots, and I'm yes. wondering how they, if okay. we know how Jesus related to them, if we know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Sadducees um, come into, somewhat into the picture with the chief priests. They're not really opposed to Jesus, except to the extent that the, the main actors uh, opposing Christ are, this, are the chief priests in his crucifixion. Sadducees would have been among those, but they mostly are, they have their power in Jerusalem, they're associated with the temple, so they would have been concerned. We don't see a lot of them in the Gospels, because they did not believe in following all of the additional oral rules. So they didn't find themselves in conflict with Jesus most of the time, except to the extent that he, they saw him as a threat to the temple. They really wouldn't care too much about him. The Essenes um, are not mentioned in the New Testament, and we're, there's a lot of discussion about who they were, but they would have been somebody that people who would not have had anything to do with this either because the reason why they were living out by the Dead Sea is because they rejected everything in Jerusalem. We don't know what they would have thought about Jesus. There are some people who like to say that John the Baptist was one of them, but there's zero proof that he was. As a matter of fact, uh, John's washings, his baptism has nothing to do with ritual washing. You know, their, their emphasis would have been on keeping ritual purity, so I don't think that they would have agreed with Jesus, the Essenes. Um, the Zealots, of course, they, they're motivated by political power, so they wouldn't have agreed with Jesus either, that the most important thing is to love your enemies. You know, that's for sure. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Let's, we'll make this the last one. That's you, yeah. No, it's right here. Just go ahead, I'll repeat it. Well, all of this, listening, all this, taking all these people. So is Jesus viewed now as an anarchist? Is, v- is Jesus viewed today as an anarchist? Then. Was he viewed as an anarchist? I don't think they would have viewed him as an anarchist. I think they would have assumed that he wanted political power for himself because the expectation about the Messiah was that the Messiah is somebody who is going to establish a kingdom. And people were hailing Jesus as the Messiah. By the way, why is Palm Sunday such a big feast day for the Orthodox? Because Jesus is about to die, right? He's coming to the city, he's going to die. That's not why it's a, a feast day. It is the only time in his life that he acknowledged publicly who he was. He allowed the people to acclaim him as the Messiah. Most of the time he said, yes, I'm the Messiah, but don't tell anybody because it was dangerous. They associated it with political power. But when the crowd acclaims him as the Messiah, as he's coming into the city, he does not dispute that. But they would have assumed that he wanted to start his kingdom and he would, that would have caused the Romans to come and take away the political power that was currently being held by the Sanhedrin. That's why the Sanhedrin's worried about him. So no, he's not an anarchist. That's what they that wouldn't have thought that. Okay, shall we take a break at this point? Before we take a break, I'd like to introduce Leslie Hansen, okay. who is the president.